Uh, we need to get subscribe and get this unity stronger and beat YouTube at their own game. Okay, that's what this is about. Like I say, go to the remix button, hit the remix button. That way you'll have this video and, and keep up with this. Otherwise, you know, YouTube's just going to control us, guys, and it's, it's really bad. I have a sort of Turing um, test for conspiracy. You know the famous Turing test for intelligence. What you have is you have a sealed room with the um, intelligent machine or person inside the room and you're allowed to interrogate the machine or the person by asking questions through a sort of letterbox. And then on the, if, if the machine or person then gives a, um, a response, which is indistinguishable from one that would be given by some, some something that was intelligent, then you have to consider that it's intelligent. And, and it's possible to apply a similar sort of reasoning to conspiracy. In other words, if it looks like a conspiracy, <coughs> and if you ask questions about how it could be a conspiracy, and the answers all are ones that would be given if it were a conspiracy, then I think it's quite reasonable to assume it is a conspiracy. I'm going to talk about the test veterans. This is an update. I, I made an earlier um, presentation from Riga about the um, case involving Pensions Appeals Tribunal uh, in which I was an expert witness. I'll put uh, on, on the screen, I'll put the um, URL, the link of the earlier video. But uh, it's time now to update the test veterans and anyone else who's interested in this issue, which I consider to be a conspiracy, uh, on what's, what's going on. Well, as I predicted in, in my Latvian presentation, because my evidence was excluded from the deliberations of the uh, tribunal, although in fact they shouldn't have been, because they were all before the tribunal, the cases were all lost, um, as indeed they would have had to have been without my evidence. And the reason for that is that my evidence had largely to do with the failure of the ICRP risk model, the current radiation risk model, which assesses how much cancer you can get as a result of how much dose. I mean, the current ICRP uh, excess risk for cancer is 0.45 per sievert. In other words, you have to get 1,000 millisieverts to increase your risk of cancer by 45%. God, it's really hot here. Maybe I should have done this inside. Anyway, I'll soldier on. If I fall down from heat stroke, then, then um, you can see it happen on video. <laughs> That'll be fun, won't it? So where was I? Oh, I think I'm going to go inside. This is just too hot. I'll pick this up again from, from inside the wheelhouse. This is just too much. I can't sit out here. OK, that's better. Well, the cases were lost, as I said, because the um, risk model says that in order to get even a 50% a increased chance of cancer, you have to have... A, a dose of 1,000 millisieverts. Well, nobody had anything like that dose. I mean, the film badges showed doses of around 1 millisievert, maybe less than that. In exceptional cases, 10 millisieverts. Nobody got anything like 1,000 millisieverts, so therefore they couldn't possibly have got cancer. Under the, <coughs> under the rules, under the equations of the International Commission on Radiological Protection, of course, these are all based on external radiation. They're not based on internal radiation. And I will, uh, I will show in, um, in various papers that I've published, uh, which I'll put links on at the end of this, 
how it is that external and internal radiation can't be assessed in the same way. Anyway, the reason that I was pushed out by the um, solicitors, Hogan Lovells, was clearly because my arguments would have shown, and the arguments that were all before the court, that the ICRP risk model was faulty for internal radiation. Okay, well, I think I've said all this stuff, so I don't have to bore on about it. What I do want to do, to do now is to update you on what happened. Well, of course, what happened is that the uh, expert that was brought forward by Hogan Lovells, a man called Paddy Regan, Professor Paddy Regan, um, just brought forth evidence which argued that the ICRP risk model was the one that he um, ascribed to, that he considered to be accurate. And in the decision that was uh, published by the tribunal, they, are, they, they stated that, that they saw no reason, actually stated that they saw no reason to believe that the ICRP risk model was not accurate. Now actually that was a lie, because they did have in front of them all of my evidence, which was not just like me saying, it was about um, lots of scientific papers which I referred to and brought before the, uh, the court, the, the tribunal, um, that showed that the ICRP risk model was, was not accurate for internal radiation. So, in fact, they did know that. And the judge also knew that because he had been, uh, Judge Stubbs, had been a judge in other cases that I had taken where we had won on behalf of the appellants. And two of these I'll talk, to, talk about in a minute. Anyway, so this is why it was lost. So the, the witness that the that Hogan levels brought forward said that the ICRP risk model was accurate, therefore it's impossible that any of the uh, veterans could have had cancer as a result of their exposures, therefore they lost their cases. That was all straightforward. Now the question that you have to ask is why it was that the tribunal swallowed this guff. Because the tribunal, which consisted of the same tribunal that had sat in, in other cases that I had acted as expert witness for prior to all of this conspiracy, um, they knew my arguments. They had seen before them several papers that I had brought prior to, 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 to this um, collected case that showed that the ICRP risk model was wrong. Therefore, in my opinion, it was wrong for them to not um, consider this information that was before them. But the interesting thing is that under English law, they didn't have to do that. The interesting thing is that if, if um, for instance, you have a case where the prosecution and the defence both collude together to exclude critical evidence uh, and not to rely upon it, even if that evidence is available to the judge, in, in, this is in a criminal case, it turns out, according to my friend, um, Robbie Manson and to, to my colleague uh, um, Hugo Charlton, who's a barrister, that the judge can ignore that evidence. So in other words, you could have a piece of paper before a court saying that the, the murderer or the, you know, the, the, the accused murderer was actually somewhere else at the time of the murder, and so long as the prosecution and the defence both agree not to rely on that, the judge ignores it. And this seems to have been the case in this particular case. Anyway, what we have done, and this is, the, this is the reason I'm updating you, is we have found two um, witnesses, uh, not two witnesses, two, two appellants. Oh, it's hot. Really hot. We found two appellants who are prepared to, to, to um, take an appeal against this on the basis that the judge did have in front of him evidence that showed that the ICRP risk model was was in, in doubt. And, and remember, this is an, uh, this is an appeal, uh, tribunal's appeal case, where you only have to prove reasonable doubt. <coughs> you don't have to prove your case per perfectly. You just have to raise sufficient doubt that the, um, the arguments by the Ministry of Defence that the cancers could not have been caused by the radiation are wrong. And it seems to me that the evidence I brought forward did raise such doubt and that the judge ignored those pieces of evidence, which is why we brought these um, appeals. So there are two appeals out at the moment. One appeal is from Don Battersby, who was a veteran of Maralinga, of, of the Australian tests. And what he did was he, he developed uh, chronic lymphatic leukemia. And what he did was he wiped down aeroplanes that had flown through radioactive clouds, and who, which, the surfaces of which were contaminated. 
and develop this chronic lymphatic leukemia. Now the interesting thing about that, although he lost his case, the interesting thing about that is that a couple of years ago I, I, was, in a, uh, I was involved in, uh, as an expert witness in a, in a similar pensions appeal for a guy called Colin Duncan. Uh, Colin Duncan also wiped down aeroplanes which had flown through the French nuclear test of Muraraya and he developed, um, what did he develop? Cancer of some kind, I think it was lymphoma. Okay, that's right, lymphoma, he, he, uh, non-Hodgkin lymphoma. Um, and the judge found for the appellant. In other words, he, he, he won his case on the basis of the evidence that I put in. And yet exactly the same evidence was before this court and this same judge for this guy, um, Don Battersby, and he lost his case. Do you see? Truly extraordinary. And, and in, in his decision, um, and all of these papers, incidentally, now I've put up on the internet, so they're all on the Green Audit website, so you, if, if you can be bothered to read all this stuff, you can read it. I, 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 it turns out I had written 12 reports for this case, all of which were before the judge, and all of which were not considered in the decision, and all of which were excluded from the argumentation. Anyway, uh, one of those papers, which is up on the Green Audit website, um, is the decision made in the case of Colin Duncan. And in that case, the judge said lots of very nice things about me. He said, oh, well, you know, Dr. Busby's evidence was cogent and it was clear and we believe it and he's a great guy and this and that. Well, not exactly he's a great guy, but if you read it, you'll see the general tenor of what he said is that, that, is that as a result of my arguments, the case was won and the Secretary of State was shown to be uh, wrong. And that isn't the only one, because there was another case involving Guy wiping down aeroplanes. And he, he developed laryngeal cancer. And that, that is also up there. And so, there were, so, so, so he won his appeal also. So we've got two cases where people wiped down aeroplanes and then developed cancer. And the same judge, the same tribunal, found for the appellants. In this case, they found against Don Battersby. That's truly extraordinary. And very wrong. It, it's, it's, it's a case of serious injustice, which is why we, br we brought this appeal. Don Battersby has brought this appeal. So we've written to the judge asking for leave to appeal the decision on the basis of all these arguments that I've put forward. The other appeal is, a, 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 is by Anna Smith uh, in respect of her husband, who died of pancreatic cancer. Uh, now he was at Christmas Island. And a lot of the evidence that I brought forward was about Christmas Island. So as far as Christmas Island is concerned, the exposures, like the exposures at Maralinga that I'm concerned about, are internal exposures to uranium. The same exposures that we showed in Fallujah and that um, we argued in the Balkans uh, as a result of depleted uranium weapons usage were the cause of high levels of congenital malformation and cancer. This inhaled uranium is a serious matter. And sufficient evidence had come out under Freedom of Information Act requests and so forth to show that the concentrations of uranium on Christmas Island would have been quite high in the air. After all, the bombs were made of uranium. The big bomb, Grapple Y, um, it turns out, uh, consisted of about four tons of uranium, which went bang. And then it rained out over the island, black rain, black because uranium uh, oxide is black and the particles were in the rain. So these guys all, all got high doses of uranium, but of course these high doses of uranium wouldn't have been registered on their film badges, and nor would they have been considered by the ICRP risk model to have been high doses in the sense of thousands of millisieverts. But there's a huge amount of evidence now from all sorts of sources, not, not what I'm saying, but all sorts of scientific papers, including a series of papers by uh, a, a, a woman called uh, uh, Irina Guseva Kanu, who used to work for the French nuclear industry, but she's been booted out now, I think. Who, who was stud and she was studying uh, French nuclear uh, uranium workers. And uh, if you look at her papers, you can show that the ICRP risk model is wrong by a factor of about 2,400. And she studied lymphoma, okay? She studied lymphoma in these nuclear workers and found high levels of lymphoma at doses that were vanishingly small in terms of ICRP calculations. So this is what we've done. We've taken two appeals, one for, for, for Battersby and one for Smith. Now the interesting thing about Smith is that he died of pancreatic cancer. And another one of the veteran appellants, remember there's 16 of these, a chap called Williams, he also died of pancreatic cancer. 
Now the interesting thing about that is that the probability of two people in the, in, dying of pancreatic cancer at the age that they did, um, two people dying of pancreatic cancer, which are quite a rare cancer, is very, very unlikely. It's sort of hundreds of thousands to one probability against it happening. So that in itself should be sufficient to raise the issue that what happened to these guys, what they shared, was some kind of exposure that led to their pancreatic cancer. And yet the um, uh, witness that was brought by Hogan Lovells, a woman called Louise Parker, epidemiologist, she didn't draw attention to this. She could have quite easily got up into the witness box and say, look here, two people who are unrelated, dying of the same cancer out of 16 uh, individuals, is extremely unlikely. I mean, these sort of statistical te uh, tests have been used in all sorts of other cases to convict people of, of um, strangling their children and all sorts of things, you know, uh, cot deaths and whatnot. So these statistical arguments are, are quite powerful in court, and certainly as far as just trying to sort of raise doubt. So there we are. That's where we've got to. Now, the reason I'm putting this up is to just bring you all up to date, because this is a very important case, and it has to do with all sorts of um, developments relating to the, the main test veteran arguments, which, which, which as you know, are, are systematically being thrown out of courts. It's a matter of injustice, and a matter of justice. And so what I, what I want to say to you is that the veterans themselves, if they're taking any more appeals, should ask me to act as their expert witness so that we can get this stuff into the courts again and again. So let me say something about the appeal itself. The, um, the tribunal uh, is regulated by the Pensions Appeals Tribunal Act 1943. And, and the procedure is that you have to, um, in order to take an appeal against a decision, you have to ask the judge for leave to take an appeal and this we've done. And you have to lay out the grounds for this. Well, the grounds have to be uh, have to do with points of law, like a lot of appeals. You can't just say, well, we don't think that the judge was right, or his decision wasn't right. Actually, in terms of the evidence that was presented to him, if you exclude my evidence, his, his, his uh, conclusion, or the tribunal's conclusion, was pretty, pretty accurate, really. So we take this, um, the first thing, the first step is for the appellants uh, <coughs> to write to the judge and say, could you re review your decision on the basis that there has been some sort of irregularity relating to a point of law? And the particular point of law that we're concerned with has to do not with the Pensions Appeals Tribunal Act 1943, but the rules um, for this, which were actually reviewed in 2008. Uh, and this is called the Tribunal Procedure First Tier Tribunal War Pensions and Armed Forces Compensation Chamber Rules 2008. And, and we are asking the judge to, um, to review his decision on the basis that there has been a procedural irregularity. This is under Section 35D of the Rules 2008. The procedural irregularity which we're talking about is the fact that evidence was brought to the court and not considered under circumstances where there was collusion or at least some sort of evidence of collusion between the prosecution and the defence to exclude that evidence. And we're asking the judge to firstly set aside his decision on the basis that the evidence wasn't considered by the tribunal, uh, or, or failing that, to, to, um, set, to, 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 to allow us to appeal to the upper tier, so it goes up to another, another court, court and they have a look at it then. And we're doing this on the basis of Section 2 of the rules of the, tri of the tribunal procedure, first tier tribunal, war pensions and armed forces compensation chamber rules 2008. Section 2 is an important section, it's right up at the beginning, and it says, it says this, it says the overriding objective of these rules is to enable the tribunal to deal with cases fairly and justly. So we want um, the court to deal with these cases fairly and justly. And our position is that they haven't been dealt with fairly and justly because significant evidence, critical evidence, has been excluded. The essence of the appeal has to do with the fact that the um, solicitors excluded me and my evidence at the last minute when nothing could be done about it without discussing it with their clients. And their clients ultimately were the appellants themselves. I went down to Somerset to talk to Kay Battersby who was uh, helping her, her father, Don Battersby, with his appeal. I just feel that my mother 
had lost twins when, the, when my father first came back from dropping the bomb. Um, he has suffered. He's got CLL. He's got, he's had a stroke. He hasn't got a voice for himself. So I just feel that I need to push this forward. Yes. And so, just briefly, what, 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 what do you think was wrong about the way in which you've been treated in, in, in this affair, where your father's been treated in this appeal? I'd never heard of Chris Busby until I was told Chris Busby wasn't going to be um, present at the hearing. He apparently has a lot of knowledge on his condition, and he'd already written a report, and I just feel that he, it sh he should have been at the court case. And so, uh, when, when did you, um, I mean, how close to the court case was it when, when you heard that he was not going to be called? Days. About four days. And did they suggest, uh, did they suggest to you any, any way in which you could ask him to, to come and, and give evidence to yourself? No, when I asked that I would like Chris Busby present, I was told, if you do, then we will not re uh, represent you at the case. Did you, did you feel that there was some pressure being, being brought in that respect? It's a CIA or something. <laughs> Bang! <laughs> they sent the helicopters in now to check out what we're up to. So, so when you said that you wanted... Um, you wanted uh, Dr. Busby to, to be able to, to, to provide evidence on behalf of your father. Did you feel that, that there was some pressure on you to, 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 not, to not do that? Yes, definitely. Yeah, they, they, they said that if I wanted him there, then they wouldn't represent me. Um, I said that I'd give them, I wouldn't make the decision there and then. I'd, I'd let them know in the morning. Um, when I said that I would stay with them, only because my father just felt that it was just too much pressure to change everything that we'd already said that we were going to do, that we had solicitors that were going to fight for us, that we're now going to pull out at the last minute if we didn't do as we were told. And if they weren't going to call Dr. Busby, I mean, maybe, do you think it was maybe strange that they didn't discuss this with you earlier in time for you to... Definitely, call? definitely. I mean, like I said, I'd never heard of Chris Busby, didn't know who he was. I've had to do my own research on the guy. Um, so, to not have somebody that had already, they'd already asked this guy to write the report. So then why, at the last minute, decide you're not going to use him? And I was told it was because he's not mainstream. I don't want people that's mainstream. I want somebody who's going to tell the truth. That's great. That's all we need. Yeah. <laughs> that's, a, that's, oh. a, that's a very good line. So there we are. That's where we've got to. Now the reason I'm putting this up is to just bring you all up to date. Because this is a very important case and it has to do with all sorts of um, developments relating to the, the main test veteran arguments, which, which, which as you know are, are systematically being thrown out of courts. It's a matter of injustice and a matter of justice. And so what I, what I want to say to you is that the veterans themselves, if they're taking any more appeals, should ask me to act as their expert witness so that we can get this stuff into the courts again and again. This tribunal was intended, in fact it, uh, it's avowedly intended, it's written down, to actually knock, the head, uh, uh, knock on the head any, any uh, following uh, um, appeals relating to exposures at the test sites. And this it'll do if we fail, this it will do. It will be argued that the ICRP risk model is correct. None of these people got anything like the doses that could have caused their cancer. And therefore nobody else should apply for, um, for a, a, um, a pension uh, on the basis of, it, of prior exposure at any of the test sites. And of course you might wonder why they bother. Why is there a conspiracy, you know? Why not just cough up? The answer is this, that if they do concede that these cancers were caused by the, 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 the effectively quite low doses that these people uh, were um, exposed to, 
at the test sites, then it will raise, or even more raise, these the, the same questions about people living near nuclear sites, people exposed to depleted uranium, all of the arguments that we, we in the low-level radiation campaign and in Green Audit have been rehearsing again and again over the years. So what do I want you to do? Well, nothing much, really. I just want you to be informed, to keep informed about all of this. And if, if there's any way in which you can bring pressure through the media or through your MP or through anybody on the tribunal to, to, to go back and reassess its arguments uh, and to consider the, the massive amount of evidence that I brought into the courts, into the tribunal, uh, w w evidence which was just totally ignored, if you can get them to, to reopen this question, then we will win this. We will win this. If not, we will lose it. And if we lose it, it means that all of the veterans, not just these 16, but all of the veterans, will find it jolly hard in future to take any sort of case at all. There we are. Thank you for listening, and talk to you again.